Here we see a lovely lady, a lady torn between herself and reality. This lady flesh one is stuck in a world of her own, but the world is stuck in quarantine. With the ability to draw, she has entered a new dimension, the quarantine zone. Hello, art friends. My name is Fleshwad, and today I will be reading a mermaid story in light of Mermay. While it is the last day of Mermay, I could not pass up the chance to practice drawing another mermaid. Hope you enjoy. I took a job on a fishing boat. We caught a mermaid. Posted by you slash head of Spectre. I took the job on the Belil because I needed the money. I'm not an educated man, I never had the head for school, and in my town, the best way to earn your pay is fishing. I'd worked on boats before. They said the Belil paid the best. They weren't wrong about that. My town is small and coastal, that is all I will say. I don't want to give away the name. If people knew what was out here, they might come looking and I don't want that. My reason will be clear soon enough. Captain LeBlanc told me that he named the Belil after his hometown. It's a little town in the French part of Canada, not far from Montreal. What he was doing so far from home, I'll never know. LeBlanc had a gaunt face, but a full head of healthy brown hair. It was hard to say for sure just how old he was. Anywhere between 30 and 70, I might reckon. His crew was small and paid well enough. There were five of us in total. Myself, LeBlanc, Tony, Luke, and Ian. We'd often go out for a few days at a time, followed by a few days back at home. Truth be told, I preferred being out on the water. Not much to do at home and idle hands are the devil's plaything. The trawler would depart just before dawn to catch the early morning fish. Some of the crew would sleep. One man would stay up to keep watch. Then after a few hours, the crew would wake, have a cuppa, and set to hauling in the catch. We'd get to work, gutting and packing our haul. The guts went to the gulls. They were thankful for the meat. They knew when it was time to haul. And like cats, they got impatient if we took too long and shrieked at us to hurry up. We'd pack the fish in the hold and kept them in boxes, with a layer of ice to keep them fresh. It wasn't the world's most exciting job, and the process on the Belial was no different than it was anywhere else. But like I said, I was in it for money, not for adventure. There was one odd thing about the Belial that stuck out at me. See, normally there's not much in the hold, save for the ice and the boxes. You don't need much else. In the hold of the Belial though, there was this tank, fancy looking tank too, flooded with water and had wheels on it, although it locked to the ground so it wouldn't roll around. No way that boat was built with it. It had to be a custom job, but I couldn't for the life of me figure out just what it was for. I asked one of the other crewmen, Tony, about it earlier on when I'd just been hired. It's a holding cell. He said, Sometimes we catch big uns, not really the kind of things you put in with the rest of the fish. LeBlanc's got specialty buyers, though, some eccentric rich folks looking for something rare. We get one hell of a bonus when that tank's full. What kind of fish are you putting in there? I asked. The other sailor just smiled at me, showing his rotten yellow teeth. Big uns, he repeated. Stick around, good time of year to catch them. I could use the extra pay. That was all there was to be said on the matter at the time. I didn't dwell on it. My curiosity would be sated soon enough. LeBlanc had disappeared into the wheelhouse and, while Tony wasn't formally in charge, he acted the part. I didn't much care for Tony. He was stocky but not chubby, with horn-rimmed glasses a seven o'clock shadow, and a slicked back hairdo that looked like one I'd seen on every a-hole motivational speaker who'd ever BS'd his way through a sold-out event with the same advice you got from Care Bears. 
He reminded me of Ty Lopez if he'd starred in Super Size Me. He wore a wedding band, but how he'd ever convinced a bird to marry him was something I'd never understand. I breezed past him and out onto the deck. The other two guys were hauling the catch up and I moved to help them. Between the three of us, with Tony standing back and yelling orders, we managed all right. That's it lads, beautiful haul, I heard Tony yell as the net was set down. Yet, as it moved, I saw movement deep inside it, something bigger than a fish. I squinted before I saw it, and amongst the squirming, silvery bodies of our catch was what I recognized as a human hand. It grasped for purchase on the edge of the net. Hold up! I called. Someone's in there! Was that? The other men asked. I think it was Luke. Lower the net! I see a hand! I called and waved for them to do so. I saw Luke move for the controls and lower it. As he did, I saw a figure pushing themselves above the fish, and I heard a voice. I think it was human. It sounded human or close enough that I could not tell the difference, but I did not recognize the words. Tony had run to the net as soon as it was low enough for him to do so. I didn't notice the grin on his face as he reached for the hand, helping the person inside out. I knew it was a woman. Her tangled hair looked odd. It was a mossy, greenish color. There looked to be wounds on her neck. She needs a doctor, I remember saying, but neither of the men paid any mind to that. Get the tank, Tony said. I saw Ian take off, rushing down into the hold. Captain LeBlanc had stepped out of the wheelhouse and was watching as Tony and I pulled the girl free from the pile of fish she'd been in. Her skin felt cold and slimy to the touch. And when I saw a long, slick body with silvery scales, I would have sworn we'd pulled a larger fish out with her. It took me a moment before I realized what I was seeing. That girl's lure half looked like a fish. She had shiny, silvery scales and twitching fins. She said something in whatever unknown language she spoke, and I saw her weakly trying to push herself away from Tony. I ended up backing off of her, but Tony held her tight. Come on, come on, he said, unconcerned by the fact that he was holding a mermaid. He just led her to the hold and peeked over to make sure the tank was in place. Her tail slapped against the deck. She tried to force herself out of his grip and very nearly succeeded. She would have if Luke hadn't caught her. Burn the tank around. Tony called. I could hear it rolling along the floor of the hold, but I stood dumbstruck, unable to react. This was a mermaid. A real-life mermaid. I didn't snap out of my stupor until I watched Luke and Tony toss the struggling creature into the hold. I heard water splash and wet flesh smack against the glass. Close her up and lock her in, Tony cried. We're getting a bonus, boys. He looked over at me, grinning wide from ear to ear and showing off his disgusting yellow teeth. Big un, he said, his voice brimming with pride. Luke stared down into the hold, watching as Ian rolled the tank back into place. I watched the disoriented mermaid swimming around inside, desperately looking for a way out. I could hear her babbling in her own language. No doubt, begging us to throw her back, but no one listened. No one but me. I looked up at Captain LeBlanc. He smirked before returning to the wheelhouse. I saw him reaching into his pocket for his cell phone. No doubt, ready to make a phone call. Alright, back to it boys, Tony said. The goals are screaming, it's time for breakfast, don't keep him waiting. Ian pulled himself out of the hold and nudged me snapping me out of my stupor. I only took one final look at the dark hold before setting to work, but I could still hear the frantic, terrified babbling of the mermaid inside. 
I didn't get the chance to see her again until we were close to done with the packing. Luke had been going back and forth into the hold to bring the packed fish in. I had my station to tend to, but as we set the nets again and got ready for a few more hours of trolling, I had my chance. Nobody cared to stop me as I went down to the hold either. I didn't mind the stink of the fish or the cold. I can't imagine the mermaid did either. She sat at the bottom of the tank, completely submerged and almost curled into a fetal position. The position seemed so human. Everything about her from the waist up seemed human. Her head tilted upward as I drew nearer. She studied me and, as she did, I studied her. Her hair seemed to have moss or algae growing in it, giving it a greenish color. Her skin had a greenish tint and a pattern that I imagined was camouflage, but it was faint. Her face looked human, save for the gills on her neck. The fear in her eyes seemed so distinctly human. There was an intelligence there, one that I recognized. She kept herself entirely submerged and seemed to shrink back as I got closer. I stopped my advance. The last thing I wanted to do was hurt her. She was beautiful. Surreal, but gorgeous. She was an old legend come to life. And she lived up to it in every aspect. Odd little things, ain't they? Luke asked. I heard his boots thud onto the floor behind me and turned to see him walking up to me. Yeah, I replied. Very. Look just about human, right? He asked. Threw me for a loop the first time, too. I hear there's inland ones, fish folks like this, but they can pass as real people. Can you believe it? Walking on two legs and everything. One of the guys who was with us before told me about him. How many have you seen? I asked. I don't know. This one might be the fifth. They're rare, but worth it if you catch one. Most folks lose them. If you don't trap them quick, they get away on you. Usually, they're disoriented after coming out of the water, but last year we had one that tore right out of the net, gave Ian a right beating before jumping back overboard. They're a lot stronger than they look. I found it hard to believe that this fragile thing could hurt anyone, but Luke sounded convinced. I listened as he lit up a cigarette beside me. You gonna gawk all day at it? Ian brought a deck of cards. Thought we might have a round poker before we do the whole song and dance. Yeah, I'll be right there, I said. I allowed myself one parting glance at the mermaid before I left her there, but she was never far from my mind. Seeing her stuck in that tank, lethargic and depressed, the fear written all over her face, it didn't sit right with me. It didn't seem right to let something like her suffer in a tank, and who knew what was waiting for her when we got back to land? No, it didn't seem right at all. I told myself to let it go. I tried to bribe myself with the bonus. I couldn't. Every time I closed my eyes, I thought of the mermaid sitting there in her tank, alone and afraid. She'd been trying to speak to us. I remembered the sound of her voice, even though I hadn't understood the words. Thinking back on it, though, I suspect that she was trying to beg us to set her free. I'm fine with killing fish. I could gut them all day. Fish stare up at you with wide, dumb eyes. Their expression never changes, even when they die. Fish are stupid. That girl in the tank, though, she wasn't no fish. I looked in her eyes. She wasn't dumb. I knew there was something there. Something either human or as close to human as you can get. Either way, over the next few days, she was never far from my mind. I visited her from time to time, watching as she sat lethargically in the tank. I watched Luke feed her once a day. He tossed a few gutted fish into the tank just so she wouldn't starve. Otherwise, she sat there and did nothing. No hope for escape and no idea what her future held. The poor thing, I pitied it. No, pity wasn't the word. Compassion might be more fitting. On the day we made port, I knew I was going to set it free. I had to. I wouldn't sleep right otherwise if I didn't. I'd see those eyes in my sleep, asking me why he didn't at least try. I was on watch while Captain LeBlanc steered us into the harbor. Ian and Luke were down in the hold. I had no idea where Tony had effed off to. I didn't have much of a plan. 
other than to keep an eye on the mermaid and wait for an opening. Luke had said they were strong. I was hoping I could tip the tank over when no one was looking and blame it on the mermaid. Wasn't much of a plan, but it was better than nothing. It was early morning as we steered into the harbor, and when we moored, I helped the other men unload the boxes of fish we'd packed. I saw Tony in the back, near the tank, wrapping it up in a tarp, making sure no one else saw what was inside. I reasoned we'd take the mermaid out last. I was right. LeBlanc came by to check in on us when the hold was almost empty. He stared at us, then at the covered tank. Tony immediately ran to his side like a loyal pet. He and LeBlanc exchanged some quiet words before Tony went back towards the tank. I watched as he unlocked it from its place and rolled it towards the front of the hold. Tony hitched the tank to the crane and had it lifted out. LeBlanc met it down on the dock. He waited for Tony to help him wheel it away. There he goes, I heard Ian say. Time to get our bonus. What are they going to do with it? I asked. Ian just shrugged. Hell if I know, probably a zoo or something. Maybe they keep them in a lab or something. I bit the inside of my cheek at the thought of that poor girl in another cage, being gawked at by scientists with no idea of what she was. The less we know, the better, Ian said, as if he knew what I was thinking. Best to leave those things alone. I can't say I agreed with him. The next box I took was my last. I set it down on its skid and kept walking. Luke and Ian were down in the hold. They didn't see me leaving. I went off in the direction Tony and LeBlanc had gone off in. I kept a steady pace. They hadn't gotten far and it wasn't long before I caught up with them. The harbor was mostly an industrial area. Lots of cold storage warehouses to keep and process the fish. People went about their business and nobody noticed me tailing LeBlanc and Tony. I followed them towards one of the nicer warehouses. They headed down the side, towards a large door that LeBlanc opened, so Tony could push the mermaid in, then followed him inside before closing it behind him. It was locked again by the time I had actually gotten to the door. Not surprising. I took a short walk around the perimeter of the warehouse, hoping for another way in. I was in luck. There was a more formal set of doors that I found unlocked, and I quickly pushed my way inside. In my single-minded purpose, I hadn't yet determined what I would do when I found the mermaid. I couldn't just run away with her, and we were far enough from the water that she likely wouldn't have made it back to the ocean in time before she asphyxiated. But I didn't care. My one focus was finding the mermaid. That was it. In the end, I suppose I got what I wanted. I could hear voices up ahead and kept my footsteps quiet as I turned towards them. I recognized one of them as Captain LeBlanc and strained to hear his voice. Understand that the location is not quite the most exquisite. However, if you want a delicacy fresh from the depths of the sea, we're better than at its edge. I saw light through a doorframe up ahead and stayed close to the wall as I peeked through it. What I saw caught me completely off guard. There was a wooden U-shaped table with several people around it. Most of them were dressed well and did not look like locals to my little community. LeBlanc stood tall, near the head of the table, a freshly poured glass of wine in his hand. There was a small little grill, the kind I'd seen once before at a Korean restaurant out of town. The whole idea of that restaurant had been to cook your own food. They brought it out raw and... Oh, God. As soon as the thought crossed my mind, I saw a door at the far end of the room open. Two men escorted a gurney that would fit perfectly into the U and dent in the table. I recognized the slimmery shiver of the scales strapped to that gurney and the pleading voice of the mermaid. She struggled weakly against her bonds. Even from my vantage point, I could see the tears in her eyes as she looked at her soon-to-be killers. A hand went to cover my mouth, masking my own shock and horror as she wheeled past LeBlanc and sat in the middle of the diners. She shook and tried to raise her tail. She babbled hoarsely as she looked around at the assembled diners. 
As promised, mes amis, fresh from the sea, bon appetit, LeBlanc said with a gentle smile. He raised his glass of wine in a toast. Those at the table with wine did the same before they took up their knives and closed in on the mermaid. She screamed as the knives entered her flesh. Her eyes went wide with agony. I should have run in, I should have stopped them, but I've remained rooted to the floor in horror. They cut away pieces of her, letting her dark blood trickle out across her shimmering scales and onto the gurney. I could hear the simmering sound as her meat touched the grill. I could smell her as she cooked. All the while, she screamed at the top of her lungs. Her head shook from side to side. She tried to struggle and free herself from the straps that kept her bound down to the gurney. No one in the room cared, no one but me. I felt the tears streaming down my face as she was eaten alive. I listened as she begged in her strange tongue, screaming for this torture to stop, until someone forced a rag into her mouth to silence her. Even then, I could still hear her muffled sobs as they carved her apart. I could see bone through her wounds. Her chest rose and fell rapidly. She must have been going into shock. Tears trickled down her cheeks, and as her struggles weakened, I felt her eyes on me. She was looking at me, and in that gaze I saw her silent plea for help, even as mutilated as she was, with surgical chunks removed from her. She was still desperate for a chance to survive. Her gaze was suddenly interrupted by a long, drawn-out scream as her abdomen was neatly sliced open by LeBlanc. If you don't mind, I myself enjoy the liver and brain, he said. You must try them, they really are something. She looked down as her body was cut open and more pieces of her were removed to be cooked. I could see her shaking, either out of fear or shock. But still, I could not will myself to move. I stood there, watching as her head rested against the gurney. Her rapid, terrified breathing was slowing. How much blood had she lost? I watched as it got slower, amongst the party around her. Slower. 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 She barely seemed to react to each additional cut taken from her flesh, or the additional organs removed from her body. Her last exhale barely left her. I could see her lungs deflating, and her eyes staring vacantly up at the ceiling as she faded, unwilling and afraid. I watched her die. I saw the very second where she simply stopped. I think that out of all the people in the room, I was the only one who did. I don't remember leaving. I don't remember anything except stumbling on legs made of jelly towards the water and falling to my knees on the edge of the harbor so I could vomit. Then I hugged myself tight, crying in shame, horror, and disgust at what I had just seen. They'd eaten her alive. Despite her obvious fear, despite her obvious will to live, they ate her. And they didn't even have the common effing courtesy to kill her before they started. What I had seen would haunt me for the rest of my life. I knew it would. I felt that in my very soul. I had let that mermaid die. I would not make that mistake again. I was fortunate that I had a few days off after what I saw. It allowed me, at the very least, enough time to compose myself. The bonus I got was generous but not enough to allow me to let what I'd seen happen again. There was no amount of money that would make that acceptable. When the time came for the Belial to go out again, I didn't speak a word of what I saw. I focused on my work as best as I could. The hungry screaming of the gulls made me uneasy now, though. The simple act of sliding a knife through the gut of a fish did as well. As did the sight of their pinkish organs. Still... I bore it, and I let my mind return to the mermaid. I obsessed over everything I'd done since I'd first laid eyes on her. I thought about what I would do different. I knew it was only a matter of time before we saw another one. And when we did, 
I would save her from that bloody fate. I wouldn't fail another one. It was over a month before I got my opportunity. It was much later in our trip that we found our second mermaid. We were already on our way back. Time would be short. As the net was out of the water, I could see her arm hanging out. She was desperately trying to pull at the net and to break it to escape. Ho oh, ho, we got a big one, boys. I heard Tony yell. Luke let out a cheerful whoop as he brought back the crane around to deposit the hull onto the deck. Ian had already taken off to get the tank and wheel it into position so we could toss her in, just like we'd done before. I could see the mermaid struggling in the neck. She displaced fish as she fought to get free. She was far more spirited than the other one had been. Her scales had a greenish sheen to them, her messy hair had the same algae in it, but she cursed at us in the same foreign language. Well, well, we've got a fighter, Tony said. Luke, give her a drop, will you? Luke let the crane drop her and I heard the mermaid cry out in pain. Tony was immediately on top of the net, opening it and working to pull the disoriented mermaid out. He called for me to help him, and of course I did. Together we dragged the disoriented mermaid towards the hold, so we could drop her into the tank. I watched as she plummeted into the water. She rolled over inside of it, bumping against the glass and thrashing as she tried to escape with no success. Lock her in, Ian. Tony said. I'll go break the news to the captain. He grinned, flashing those ugly yellow teeth of his before taking off his glasses to clean away the specks of water on them. I watched him go before I went to help Luke start gutting the fish. The seagulls were hungry. Time to feed them. I joined him on the little work table we'd set up, and then picked up a knife to help him get started. The work went by in a blur. The movements were almost mechanical. Got the fish, toss the innards, wash it, pack it in the box. Gut, toss, wash, pack, gut, toss, wash, pack. The knife felt slippery, but comfortable in my hand. I kept my head down and focused on the work until it was done. I tried not to think of the mermaid, but I could hear her babbling angrily deep in the hold. The last one had been scared. This one was angry. I imagined her struggling on the gurney, screaming in rage and finally terror, as she was cut apart. My grip on the knife tightened. I tried to block the memories and mental images out of my mind. Gut, toss, wash, pack. 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 Oi. As Ian took the last box of fish down to the hold, Luke shook me gently on the shoulder. We're having a game of poker, you in? Yeah, give me a minute, I'll clean this up. I said. He nodded. Alrighty then, thanks mate. He patted me on the shoulder and took off. The knife still sat in my hand. I didn't let it go. I set to work, cleaning up the tables and putting most things away. The knife stayed on my person though. The sun was starting to go down. We were due in port sometime tomorrow in the early afternoon. I wondered if they eat the mermaid immediately again, or perhaps they rushed to get her served, since we'd gotten in a little late. It hardly mattered. I looked up towards the wheelhouse where Captain LeBlanc was. I could see him through the window, looking out at the darkening horizon. He'd probably weigh anchor for the night soon enough and turn in. I could see some coastline nearby. Not our port, but close enough to land. We were on our approach back home. These waters weren't good for fishing. Too shallow. Too many rocks. I could see the light of civilization far in the distance and a few boats even closer to shore. A good distance ahead of us, I could see a small outcrop. Too small to be an island, but awfully far from land. I was sure I'd seen it before, but I'd probably paid little mind to it. It was never important to me before. We'd passed it in a good 15 minutes or so. Tony and Ian and Luke were all below deck, not in the hold. No doubt having a drink, playing cards, and getting ready to turn in. I knew they were waiting for me, 
not wise to keep them waiting for too long. With the knife in my hand, I turned and headed up to the wheel box. Captain LeBlanc barely turned his head to acknowledge me as I entered. Something you need? He asked. His tone was level, not angry, inquisitive. I remembered the way he'd cut the screaming mermaid open. If you don't mind, I myself enjoy the liver and brain, he'd said. I wondered if he eaten her brain. LeBlanc looked over at me, confused by my silence. He said my name, tearing me out of my thoughts. Is everything alright? He asked. I looked him dead in the eye. The knife was gripped tightly in my hand. He hadn't noticed it yet. It was now or never. He'd gutted her without so much as flinching as she'd struggled. He hadn't seen her basic humanity and yet here he was, on the verge of killing yet another beautiful creature. And again, I felt as if I could not lift a finger to stop him. I stared into his eyes, my own, wide, as I felt myself shaking. Are you okay? You look white as a sheet. LeBlanc reached out towards me. The next thing I knew, the knife was in the side of his neck. I'd launched myself at him, forcing us both to the ground as his hot blood spurted over my hands. I pulled the knife free of him. He weakly pushed against me, but he did not have the strength to stop me. My teeth gritted to stop myself from screaming. I brought the knife down again. It glanced off the side of his head, leaving a deep gash in his face. He struck me, almost forcing me off of him. No. He grunted, defiant of his fate, defiant like the mermaid. He too wanted to live. I brought the knife down again. It found a home in his eye. LeBlanc screamed a strangled, agonized cry. With all of his remaining strength, he pushed me off of him. Frantically, he kicked to both keep me at bay and push himself away from me. I scooted back onto my rear watching as LeBlanc tried to pick himself up. The knife jutted out of his eye socket. I saw his remaining eye wide with terror. He looked at me as I leapt to my feet and came for him again. He could only desperately raise his hands to try and defend himself as in my madness, I seized him by his hair and slammed his head against the rear wall of the wheelhouse. He grunted in pain and tried to pull away from me. He twisted his body back towards me and I clumsily pushed him forwards. He half fell, half stumbled towards the dashboard. As he hit it, his head jerked forwards. It must have been simple bad luck that it struck at the wrong angle. The knife was forced further into his skull, and the Blanc's legs gave out beneath him. He sagged to the floor and hit the ground with a heavy thud. Then, there was silence. He did not move again. Blood pulled around his head from his many wounds, and all I could do was stare helplessly. I looked down through the window at the deck. I was alone. Ahead, I could see the rocky outcrop. I remembered what I had set out to do now. I tore my eyes away from LeBlanc and put my hands on the wheel. Slowly, I steered the balil towards the rocks and increased our speed. The engine would do the rest. With the course set, I made my way out of the wheelhouse and down to the hold. The tank waited for me, and in it I saw the mermaid. She was a vision to behold, just as the last one had been. She looked up at me as I drew near, pressing her hands against the glass and watching me as I worked. You'll be free soon, I promised her. She didn't reply. She simply studied me with her lovely green eyes as I unlocked the tank from its position, allowing it to slide about freely. I took a step back, knowing what was about to happen and yet still not ready for it. The mermaid looked at me with the mixture of expressions, confusion, frustration, fear. The troller shifted, so did her tank. She looked around, concerned. I could hear footsteps above me. What the hell's taking so long? I heard Tony ask. We're all waiting on you. I looked back to see him coming down into the hold. He was just a few feet in front of me when the Belil hit the rocks. 
The reaction was more intense than I had expected. In an instant, my world turned sideways. My feet no longer touched the ground. Neither did Tony's. He struggled to keep his balance before he was dashed against the wall, then tumbling up against the ceiling. I heard glass shatter and felt water splash against me in the moment before I saw water gushing up through the opening to the hold. Tony was tossed to the side as it flowed in and hit me suddenly as well. Shockingly cold and salty, I heard Tony scream my name and saw him trying to pick himself up as the hold began to flood. Boxes of fish and ice had been strewn about. I'd never seen Tony so scared in my life. Run! I heard him yell. He stumbled towards me as fast as he possibly could. He was soaked to the bone. His glasses were missing, but he was still coming for me. Go! Run! I heard glass cracking behind me and turned to see the mermaid push her way out of her broken prison. She poked her head out and fixed me in her lovely gaze. I met her eyes and took a step towards her. She was so beautiful, just like the last one. Her skin seemed so smooth. Her breasts were just perfect. I needed to touch her, to feel her skin under my palm. I needed to. Instead, I felt Tony's hand on me, pulling me aside in the moment before she lunged. He screamed as her weight bore down on him. The water around him ran red. I stumbled back, listening as he shrieked in agony and listening to the sounds of his flesh being torn from his bones. I could see a familiar mortal terror in his eyes. The mermaid had him pinned. There was no escape. I stumbled backwards my heart racing at the sight of him dying. I couldn't watch. I didn't want to watch. But I did. She sank her teeth into his throat, tearing out a mouthful of flesh and swallowing it whole. After another bite, Tony's head was torn clean off his body. She just kept searching for more meat to consume. And yet, for just a moment, she looked up at me. Her lips curled back in a snarl, showing needle-like blood-stained teeth. As the hold flooded, she moved towards me. The water wasn't deep enough to swim yet, but even without swimming, she was faster than I could have imagined. Her body twisted like a snake as she ran towards me, using her arms to move herself forwards. I backpedaled as fast as I could before suddenly the ground beneath me gave out. I'd reached the entrance of the hold and I fell backwards into the deep, dark waters. I kicked and struggled to find my way to the surface. All I found was the inverted deck of the Belil. My lungs screamed for air as I felt along it until I reached the edge. Then I shot up to the surface, breaking it and sucking in greedy long fills of air. I flailed, trying to find something solid to cling to. It wasn't so long before I found the rocks and managed to crawl up onto them. I felt like I was only barely alive. My ears were ringing. My pulse was pounding. I coughed up seawater and I felt truly exhausted. My muscles gave out and I collapsed onto the hard stone. The last thing I remember seeing was the inverted shape of the Belial sinking in the fading sunlight. Then I lost consciousness. Most of Tony, Luke, Ian, and LeBlanc's bodies were eventually recovered in the weeks following the sinking of the Belial. I'm told that there was significant damage done to them. It's believed that they were partially eaten by some of the local fauna. Fish can do a lot to a man's face, you know. For what it's worth, I don't think they ever figured out that LeBlanc had been murdered. His head was in such a sorry state, and the knife was long gone. Nobody bothered to investigate further. I am the sole survivor of the Belial. I am the only person who knows what happened on that ship and what they kept in that tank in the hold. I don't know if I still believe that what I did was the right thing. At night, I lie awake remembering the sounds of death. The first mermaid, Tony, Captain LeBlanc, Luke, and Ian. Deaths I caused through my action, or inaction. I was already damned. The screams of that mermaid would have haunted me forever. But Tony and LeBlanc? Those I brought on myself. 
I think Tony's death is the one that weighs on me most. He pulled me out of the path of that mermaid. Were it not for him, I would most likely be dead as well. The irony that he died to save the man who doomed him haunts me. But not as much as the way he screamed as he was eaten alive. He sounded exactly like the mermaid at the banquet.